that, that was one of my favorite songs. Um, it has been for a long time. Uh, and while I'm here, I think of the, um, two years ago when I was doing eight to 10 miles a day, and I walked five of them at night in the dark. And I walked the neighborhoods and, and where we live, and, and I just get caught up with God. And, um, you know, I was thinking this year, that's two years removed. That's, that's history. Am I correct? That's history. That's, that's something I did. That's not something I'm doing. You know, a lot of Christians live that way yeah. on something I did, not something I'm doing. And in order for revival to be, and I'm thinking about this book title too, but in order for revival to be in our hearts and in our lives, act in our lives, we can't be in the I did. We have to be in the I do. Right. And uh, I, watch, I watch these shows. I'm, I'm a changed man <laughs> since Pastor Joe has been around. And uh, so Pastor Rick would understand this. Totally, because he's been around a lot longer. But what Pastor Joe did in terms of my with helping my office, I mean, I I watch shows now that uh, my favorite shows on TV are uh, Fixer Upper and Good the Crop and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, I, 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 uh, my daughter-in-law's my daughter-in-law's and I are getting ready to open up a little shop where we're going to do things to uh, and then sell you know repurpose stuff and. I'm a changed man, but you're going to be working at Lowe's. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be a pastor Rick on my off time working at Lowe's. But I mean, it's like I, I was thinking about all that, and 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 it in order for change to come in our lives and be lasting, we have to make efforts towards. It. I mean, if I want to do those things that are intriguing, I'm, I'm listening to this song, and when I used to listen to that song, Walking. Um, the Lord would just give me all kinds of uh, insight, and instruction. I'm standing there just getting into worship, and all of a sudden I got. My brain just turns on, and I'm thinking about this area in my backyard that I want to, want to fix up, and I've got a whole design in my head now on how to fix up that backyard area. That's, uh, but it's not about what we did. It's about what we're doing in order for revival to be in our lives. And change is important. So we're, we're, if you're alive and breathing, you should be changing. You should be growing. And what's, what's good about having someone we've never had here before, it's not our normal routine. You know, for years we've been trying to get uh, uh, Pastor Woody up here, and, and he's contacted me, and it just never worked out, never worked out. And, and every time I turn around, Pastor Jim, Pastor uh, Jack, you know, Pastor Connie, they all go, have you had Woody yet? No, I haven't. No, no, I've been meeting. So you got to get him here. you got to get him here. Well, change is about to happen in our lives today. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And we're, with excitement, we're going to have a day filled with our brother and his insight and if, if you've heard of a name it's, uh, that's been around a while in this realm of the ministry, he knows them. He's been with them. He had just told me a funny story on the way in about how he first met T.L. Osborne. If you want to share that, he can because to me it's hilarious. It sounds like something I would have done. Um, but uh, I just would like you to have the all ears, which I know you are, hearts ready to receive. And because and, we're going to hear a good word from the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. And to be at Peking tonight. We are going to take up a special offering, just like you know. We're going to take up a love offering after he after he's finished. Yeah. And we all know that this it all goes to him, amen? amen. And that's what it's all about. So would you rise and greet with me, the man of God, this morning? Yeah. Yeah. We love you, Jesus, today. Well, if you, if you love him, sit down. If not, stand up so I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my job easier. By the way. Yeah, well, you know who's no. It's just kidding. Hallelujah. You, I, I guarantee you, if you you get around me, I'm different. You know, I, I I think one of the greatest jokes the Lord's ever done is put me in the ministry. At least it's a joke he played on the church. But all I know how to do is be me. Because what I found out is God doesn't anoint you to be someone else. That's right. Even Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me. Amen. Come on. Amen. If he was trying to be someone else, he wouldn't have been anointable. That's and to be honest, when you're trying to be someone, you're not, you're not anointable. Amen. God made you one of a kind. Don't die as a copy. Come on now. <laughs> Understand that. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to Psalm 126. I am excited about... Please, I, I, you know, I can't say enough about trying to get hold of those books because it's amazing. Because, you know, 
the revival roar is really interesting. I was thinking about that because my wife's prayer partner at Old Roberts University was Terry Copeland, who is now Terry Pearson's. And they would pray every morning together. And I remember several years ago when, when my, you know, Terry and, and George Pearson's were, you know, speaking at Victory Christian Center, you know, my, Terry came up and gave my wife a big hug and made a statement. She said, you know, my dad taught me how to pray the Word of God, but you taught me how to listen to the Holy Ghost. And literally that book, Revival Roar, is a book on prayer. And it's very important. Let me say something that, you know, every failure in life is a prayer failure. Every success in life is a prayer success. Failure and success are always tied to prayer. Because one thing we need to understand is we're not trying to get God to answer prayer. He's already answered. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 65, 24 said, Before you called, I answered. Right. While you're speaking, I hear. If you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. If he hears you, you got it. Why? Because it's already been answered. We're not trying to convince God to do anything. He's already done it. We're positioning ourselves to receive. That's right. And it's funny this year, I, you know, God said before I preach anywhere, he said, you know, I'll never forget, it was happening in September, and the Lord said, before you speak, he said, I want you to get the people saying, I see revival. I see revival. And that thing hit me because in 19, I believe it was 1989, God, that's only other time God's told me to tell people to say the same thing, you know, month after month. All my churches, and we have about 30 under our ministry, all our churches, back in 1989, you know, we had banners on the wall, the wall will fall. And everywhere I came, I, like God said, I want you to begin to have the people proclaiming the wall will fall. Now, what we didn't know was what was about ready to happen six months later, the Berlin Wall came down. But God knew prophetically what needed to be announced. Yeah. Come on now. Yes. And, then, and back in September, late September, God said, I want you to begin to say, get the people saying, I see revival, which means something's about ready to kick. Yes. Something is yes. about ready to kick. I want you to say that. I see revival. I see revival. How many of you understand? If you're not looking for it, you can miss it. Yes. Come on now. And literally, God wants us to understand. I asked God about this year, and I, I said, Lord, Lord, what is this year? And, and for me, he gave me a phrase. I know Apostle Callian said it's a year of increase. Every one of us hear different aspects of what God's doing. But God spoke to me that this year would be the year of the turnaround. That God wants to turn things. Come on now. Yeah. He wants to turn what the enemy meant for evil and work it for good. Yeah. He wants to turn your sickness into health. That's he wants right. to turn yeah. your poverty into wealth. Yes. He wants to turn this nation back to him. Yes. Amen. There's one last move of God left. Hallelujah. And he said, he told me, he said, yeah, in my daily reading, I start off with Psalm 126 every day. When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion. Amen. He said, we were like those who dream. I asked God, I said, God, what's wrong with America? He said, they don't know how to dream. See, honestly, there's a key, there's a key in scripture, and we'll get into even more tonight. What you see is what you get. You can never have something that you don't see first. That's right. Amen. You never can. And to be honest with you, I, the biggest problem in America is the American dream has been dying. And America's been going downhill. Why? Because slaves can't dream. Right. So God turns your captivity so you can dream again. You, and once you begin to dream again, your mouth is filled with laughter. Come on. Yeah. Why? Because joy comes from the unseen realm, not from the seen realm. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Joy is always tied to vision. Joy is always tied to revelation. You're like, the, it said your mouth will be filled with laughter. Your tongue, come on, with joyful shouting. He said, then they'll say among the heathen. <laughs> or among, yeah, among the nations. Same thing. Yeah. The Lord. You know there's revival. You know you're living God's dream. And you're supposed to live God's dream. Yes. 
You know that literally when you live it, even the heathen will acknowledge it. It's one thing for them to say, you're lucky. It's another when the heathen are saying, the Lord. Yeah. Come on now. Right. The Lord has done great things for us. And the Lord has done great things for us, and we're glad. Yeah. It goes on to say that literally we'll go about with precious seed. And literally weeping. And I, I, this is what God showed me. He said, you know, your heart and your seed have to be connected. Yeah. In order to have supernatural harvest, it's not enough to sow seed. Your heart and your seed have got to be connected. Yes. Yeah, that's it. And it said literally there are those, they're going through the motion, but their heart's not in it anymore. Mm -hmm. That's why I said don't, don't lose heart. Mm -hmm. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart in doing what's good because you're going to miss the harvest. Because mm -hmm. there's no heartless harvest. Not from God. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Understand that. But he said, those that have their heart connected to the harvest, they're going to come back with the sheaves with them. Amen. We're about ready to see the fulfillment of every vision. Yes. Yes. We're about ready to see the fulfillment. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Yes. Keep seeing, saying, and sowing. That's faith. You see it in the spirit. You begin to say it and yes. speak what you've seen, and you take steps towards it. You sow towards it. Yes, that's right. Amen. Amen. Does this make sense? Yes. yes. I began to ask God, you know, as God said this would be a year of the turnaround, I, I was about ready to speak at the at the prophets meeting at Brother Phillips Church in uh, January, early January, and the Spirit of God spoke to me, at, you know, the day before I was scheduled to speak, and he said, you want to know what the greatest sin of the church is? And I said, Lord, it's got to be some, some part of unbelief. What's over is not faith is sin. He said, honestly, he said, it's prayerlessness. He said, literally, because my, you know, my people are not receiving what I've already provided. He said, I've already answered their prayers, but they're not praying them, so they can't have it, because all the blessings, all the blessings are activated, or voice activated. And your voice activates your inheritance. No one else's voice. Come on. No one else can tap into your blessing. It has to be your voice on your inheritance. Right. Right. Come on now. Hallelujah. That's why you, it's not enough to believe. You've got to confess it. You have to have your speaker attached to your believer. Come on now. You know, I begin to understand that, and, and, and God began to, to tell me, he said, you know, there's a, there's a phrase I, that I'm living, Philippians 4, 6, in everything by prayer. In everything by prayer. In ev what would happen if we prayed about everything? Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer. In everything by prayer. You know what God says? You need to start praying about everything. 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 You don't have to have long prayers, but you need to have constant prayers. Come on now. Pray about everything. Put everything in God's hand. What would happen if we prayed about everything? We would worry about nothing. Peace would begin to take over. Come on. Yes. You know, and I began to, to, to ask God about this. I said, God, I said, and, and, I mean, God began to show me more and more and more that he said, man, my, my people have not because they ask not. Until now, they've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive your joy. Shall be made full. He said, oh, that my people would just begin to speak to me. He said, you know, when you face a problem, you know, God says, call me. I don't know what to do. He said, call me. I got this situation. Call me. God's phone number is Jeremiah 33, 3. <clears throat> Call them to me. And I'll show you because God, God, God is into technology. He said, hey, I, when you call me, I'm going to give you a picture. I'm going to show you something. Come on now. Open up the screen and you're going to be able to see. Yes. Call me. I'll show you. But see, you know, God said the problem is, is I got things to show, but no one's calling. Come on. Yes. Whatever you're facing, call him. Call him. See, when, when the disciples wanted to learn how to do anything, they didn't say, teach us how to teach. They didn't say, teach us to do miracles. 
In fact, even when Jesus described his house, he didn't say it was a house of worship. Although worship's a big part of it. He didn't even say it was a house of teaching. He said in Matthew 21, you know, 13, that my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. He said, if it's my house, it's a house of prayer. I began to ask, I, I said, God, how come, I, how come we're not seeing more? He said, because the people aren't asking more. A lot of churches, they have a really, they gain momentum in January, and they lose it the rest of the year. Because in January, many churches have an emphasis on fasting and prayer. And as their prayer life increases, momentum begins to happen. But when their prayer life goes back to the way it was, everything goes back to the way it was. God wants to turn this, this life this year. He wants turnarounds, but nothing's going to turn unless we pray. Yes. Nothing is going to turn unless we pray. And in fact, honestly, God says, I'm not allowed to move unless you ask me. Because heavens belong to God, and the earth is given to the sons of men. Psalm 115, verse 16. Jesus said when he taught him to pray, it goes back to who's your daddy. Everything goes back to who's your daddy. Our father. Our father. Come on now. Right. And depending on how you view the father, you'll either beg or believe. That's right. Come on now. If you think God is mean and, 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 and you're trying to convince him, you don't begin to beg God instead of believe. Religious people have faith in prayer. Believers pray in faith. Yes, yes. That's good. Come on now. If you don't believe you received it, when you prayed, you didn't pray. You worried on your knees, but you didn't pray. You may have gone to your closet, but you were just there by yourself. Come on now. This makes sense. Yes. Our Father, come on. Everything goes back to who's your daddy. He's a good, good father. He's not withholding any good thing. He wants you more healed and more blessed than you do. He wants people more saved than what you want them to be saved. There's nothing that you want that's good that God doesn't want more. That's right. Amen. Come on now. Understand that. It's not, and, and, you know, God's not stopping it. We are. Something's about ready to break. Come on. Yeah. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You know God said? This is what God told me. He said, I cannot manifest my kingdom unless you command me. Understand, when Jesus told me how to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, was like commanding God to do it. That's not a suggestion. That's not a begging. That's not even an asking. That's a command. Come on. Amen. See, we have to view diff differently because if we don't understand authority, we don't get what we're supposed to get. And Isaiah talks about commanding the work of his hands. And I said, God, is it that, you know, we're not above you. He said, well, in one sense, he said, and when you're submitted to me on earth, he said, I, I rule in heaven. You rule on the earth. And he said, if you don't command me, even though it's my will, I can't do it. Because whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. If you don't give me permission, I can't do it because I gave this thing over to you. Amen. It's a whole different concept. Come on. It's a whole, and as long as you're submitted to God, you're in authority down here. The moment you're no longer submitted to God, then honestly, the world's in authority. The devil's in authority. Whatever you don't forbid is expressly permitted. That's right. You know, you say, well, I didn't say anything negative. No, you said nothing. And saying nothing is giving permission to the devil. The original sin was Adam saying nothing. It wasn't Adam saying the wrong thing. Come on. And the greatest sin in all of our lives is saying nothing. 
And whatever we don't forbid is expressly permitted. Let's move on. Is this okay? It better be. It's what I got. <laughs> but the early church, it was birthed in prayer. Come on now. You know, you know how many of you understand? You, you, anytime you see a move of God, everything was preceded by prayer. Everything. Yes, that's right. The early church had a prayer meeting. And some things never change. Jesus shows himself alive, raised from the dead, with infallible proofs, according to Acts chapter 1. Over 500 people saw him raised from the dead. And you know, he invites them all to a prayer meeting. Now understand something. They saw him die. They saw him get crucified. They knew he was laid in the tomb. And they saw him walking around alive. And he invites them to a prayer meeting. And still only 120 show up. <laughs> If it was the supper room instead of the upper room, it would have been a full house. <laughs> Come on now. You know that's right. Come on. But those 120 people birthed something. Yes. They birthed the church. Yes. The church was birthed in prayer. Everything is birthed in prayer. Everything. You know why many, oh, you, you're sitting here today, if you're a believer, someone prayed. That's right. Yes. You know, most of you should have been dead many times over. But someone's prayed. You may have more cat lives than cats. <laughs> cat may have nine lives. You have more than that. Because you had a praying mama or a praying grandma. It's hard to kill somebody when they have someone praying for them. Come on now. Is this helping somebody? Yes. See, the early church prayed about everything. <laughs> As soon as Zion travails, she gives birth. As soon, as soon, as soon. I, I believe we're about ready to birth something, but our prayer life has got to change. You know, one of the things is I've got such a heart for revival. And I know that if we don't pray now, the nation as we know it is lost. I'm not saying six months from now. I mean now. Because this is the most critical point in the history of this nation. Yes. That's right. And if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven to heal the land. But if they don't, the land will be destroyed. God said, don't blame me if you didn't pray about it. And if you prayed about it in faith, you'll never have to blame me. <laughs> you'll bless me. You'll thank me. Their prayer was so dynamic behind it all. There was prevailing prayer, conquering prayer, prayer that got heaven's attention. Andrew Murray said, God rules the world and the church through the prayers of his people. That God should have made the expansion of his kingdom to such an extent depending on the faithfulness of his people in prayers, a stupendous mystery and absolute certainty. Think about that. See, if your prayer life doesn't change, nothing changes. Something happened to me years ago. I, I, I used to always, and I used to, I would make this statement. I said, God, I'm a man of the word, but I'm not much of a man of prayer. Because I could stay for hours and hours. But when Jesus said, could you not tarry one hour? I said, no. Nah, Five minutes in tongues, five minutes in English, gotta go back. I love the word. But I wasn't a man of prayer, but I knew God wanted me to be in a different place in prayer. So then I began to pray about my lack of prayer. I said, God, you gotta work it in me. I don't want to be a discipline, I want to be alive. You know, religious people have a lot of discipline. But I said, God, I, I want to be out of revelation. I don't want to be out of just obligation. And God, you're going to have to work in me both the will and the do of your good pleasure. And God, I'm asking you to help me become a man of prayer. And I, I prayed that for years, and all of a sudden, about four or five years ago, it kicked in. And my wife will tell you that when I wake up in the morning, I'm praying. 
all throughout the day, I'm praying. When I go to bed, I'm praying. Sometimes in the middle of my, the night, I'm praying in my sleep. And, you know, what happened is as my prayer life increased, the miracle life increased. I, and it wasn't that I loved the word less. It was just when I opened it up because I had so much contact with the author. He began to reveal things to me. He began to show me things. But as my prayer life increased, revelation began to increase. Everything was tight. And guess what? I just got addicted to this. Yeah, I did. I mean, I just, I got to pray. I got to pray. I understand. If you watch Jesus' life, he, he, his whole life was prayer. Most of the time, he was trying to get away from the people. <laughs> trying to get to a lonely place to pray. Trying to get away. And, you know, they'd interrupt him so he did a miracle. <laughs> Come on now. He only did what he saw the Father doing. Come on. And how did he get revelation? Through prayer. See, the Bible says in Acts 6, 4, if you're in the ministry, you're, you're supposed to give yourself to prayer in the ministry of the Word. And the Lord said your life was out of order for years. But you gave yourself to the ministry of the Word, but you didn't give yourself to prayer. And he said, well, you know, he said, I put it in the order I want it. Come on. Amen. See, the heartfelt prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does that mean? When your heart is tied to your prayer, something happens. You move heaven. That's why when you're moved with compassion and prayer, God begins to move. It's amazing. Let me show you how this works. Several years ago, I was I, I basically started a Bible study in every every high school in Tulsa. I see your pastor. I got this old American football player saved. And I'll never forget because one day I, I'm sitting at my desk and the principal of the high school calls me up. He's weeping. And I can hear wailing in the background. He said, you need to come to school now. I said, what's going on? He said, I think God invaded our school. <laughs> This all-American football player, 6'9", weighed about 330 pounds, was walking down the hallway. And we had gotten him saved a couple of months before. And all of a sudden, he began to cry out, God, save my school. God, save my school. And literally, weeping began to break out on every floor, three floors, spontaneously. And they actually shut down school for three days and held an assembly explaining what was going on and what was God was doing in a public high school. Hallelujah. Come on now. Yes. One prayer. One prayer. One prayer. What was the prayer of a righteous man? And guess what? That young man was barely saved. But who cares? Amen. Amen. You know? Who cares? He, he was right. You know, we put on the full armor of God for one reason. We put on the full armor of God so we can pray. So many times we put on the full armor of God and we lay down and say, now it won't hurt so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. Well, honestly. You put on the full armor of God in Ephesians 6.18, it gives the purpose so that you can pray all types of prayer. All types of prayer. Come on. All types. There are all sorts of types of prayer. Mm -hmm. There's commanding prayer. Mm -hmm. Consecration prayer. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Yeah. There's all types. They're all done in faith if they're, if they're real prayer. Mm -hmm. That's right. But literally, there's all types of prayer. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Ghost will lead you. He'll lead you. He'll lead you. What, let me show you something. God will never show you any evil you cannot stop. And he'll never show you good you can't help birth. If God gives you revelation, it's always an assignment. That's good. That's good. And he expects the moment he shows it to you that you pray about it and you cooperate. God, you know, because I asked guys, God, how come you didn't show me? He said, that was none of your business. He said, your business is what I show. So don't mess with someone else's assignment. If you can't see it, doesn't mean it's not me. If you can't see it, just means it's not you to participate. Come on now. You know, there are things I know are right 
but they're not my assignment. Does this make sense? Yes. Yes. See, literally, what's, what happens is God's looking for someone to stand in the gap. Ephesians, I mean, Ezekiel 22, 30, he looks for a man to stand in the gap or a woman. And, you know, I begin to ask God about this. I, I, I said, Lord, let me show you something. You know what bothers me? Is a lot of times God will show you evil. He'll show you even judgment. And many times we get excited about it because we really want God to fry those people. <laughs> they deserve it. Come along now. God, they, they don't have the same sexual orientation. They don't have this. They don't have that. Oh, God, fry them! <laughs> The number one calling of the church is to withhold wrath. That's good. Mercy needs to triumph over judgment. Yes. God doesn't show you something for you to agree with him. He'll show you something for you to stop. I started asking. God said, you're my friend. I said, well, I know. We sing, I am a friend of God. He said, no. Think about who were my friends in the Old Testament. He said Abraham was called a friend of God. He said, you know why Abraham was my friend? Not number one, he was going to teach his kids by ways. But number two, when I was about ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and I didn't want to. It wasn't my desire to, I just had to because of holiness. I told Abraham for him to stop me. Because if someone that was righteous had to stand in the gap to withhold wrath. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And what, what Abraham gets in God's face and says, God forbid. I forbid you, God. If there's 50 righteous, surely you're not going to do that. If there's 45, 40. 35, 30, 25, 20. He got all the way down to 10, thinking there certainly would be 10. He didn't go low, low enough. We know that. But the bottom line is he was a friend of God because God didn't want to destroy the people, but he needed someone to withhold the wrath. See, the same thing with Moses. God's upset with the Israelites. And so is Moses, by the way. And neither one of them want to claim him. <laughs> God said, your people. <laughs> Moses no, said, no, they're your people. <laughs> Some of your parents know that one. <laughs> you know, when my son would come to me and say, your son, that means we're both in trouble. Yeah. Come on yeah. now. You know, but when it's something good, it's his, it's her son, my son. Look at my son. Come on now. We don't, we don't know that one. So, so we, we, we see this thing in this situation. In the context, God said, hey, Moses, I'm going to destroy the children of Israel. Start over with you. In Exodus 33. Now God used to speak to Moses face to face. A man speaks to his friend. You know what Moses said? He said, God forbid. He said, Lord, if you destroy them, you've got to destroy me first. God listened to him and changed his mind. I'm going to be honest. God's trying to raise up. You know, our job is to buy more time for a world that's dying. Yeah. Buy more time. That's buy more time. time. Yeah. Buy more time. Yeah. Withhold wrath. Buy more time. God's long suffering. There will be a day when it's going to be over, but let's buy more time. Amen. Come on. Is this okay? Yes. Jesus ever lives to intercede. And I began to, to uh, let me show you again how strong this is. I was preaching in Indiana one time years ago. And at the end of when we gave the altar call, a little girl, she was nine years old or ten, I think she was nine though. She came to the altar call and she began to intercede. I, I prayed for her, next thing I know, she began to groan so deeply in the spirit. It was painful. It was super intense. 
In fact, it was to such a level where the pastor came over to me and said, do you think this is God? And she looked like she was going to hurt herself, right? And I said, let me check. So I went over to her, and I heard the Lord say, don't you dare stop her. I looked at her, and I said, it's God. Yeah. <laughs> and for three hours, she was praying so hard, everyone else left the altar, went back to their seats quietly. It was a five-hour service that day. And she prayed for three hours. No one left the building. There were several hundred people there. You could hear a pin drop. All sorts of age groups. Nobody would dare interfere with what it was a holy thing. And at the very end, it's past midnight. Right before she came out of this, we began to laugh uncontrollably. I felt really bad. Here she is groaning. And I'm like, ha, 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 And I'm thinking, that's not right. That is nuts. <laughs> that is so wrong. <laughs> and the Lord said, you're in the delivery room. You're now seeing the baby begin to emerge. Something's being birthed before your eyes. And you're still rejoicing, but she's still got some work to do. And then a few minutes later, she began to rejoice uncontrollably. And everyone's laughing. And, you know, and after, she came up to me afterwards. She said, Brother Woody, do you mind if I, 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 I share something? She's nine years old. I said, you did all the work. You might as well tell us something. <laughs> and she said while I was praying she said I began to pray and she, she named all these, these demonic strongholds over the area named them and he said this spirit has caused a 70% divorce rate this one and she's 9 years old and she said as I was praying I saw angels from heaven coming and they were doing war with these other demonic powers and every time I would, I would pull back in prayer and not pray intensely, it seemed like the enemy was gaining ground. But every time I prayed intensely, it's just like the airway, they were being pushed out. And she said, it's done. I thought, that was cool. But I believe the proof in the puddings in the eating. And for the next 10 years in that area, there was not a gospel preaching church that didn't explode in growth. Literally, the divorce rate went from 70% to 20%. Yes. And almost every single alcoholic and drug-related thing was closed down. Literally, the addiction seemed to be stopped. Something was broken. Yeah. And she had created a level of heaven on earth. Come on. Yes, hallelujah. One girl's prayers. Now, the sad thing is the church didn't stay there. So they, they, didn't, they didn't keep it, but they kept it for about 10 years. I'm part of, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which has a tremendous explosion. You know, we have seen thousands and thousands and thousands of people. My home church. Years ago, we had 200 people. The next year, we had 4,000. It was tied to one lady's prayer meeting that broke open Tulsa, Sister Jeannie Wilkerson. They prayed for years, and one day, come on. And I'm convinced it was her prayer. I'm always convinced prayer is the forerunner of a move of God. Does this make sense? Yes. I began to ask God about something, you know, also, and this is what God showed me. He said, if I'm going to turn things... You have to cooperate with me. We always love to, to quote Romans 8.28. It's a wonderful verse. God works all things together for them that love him called according to his purpose. We know that. But we don't look at it in context. In Romans 8.26 it says, when you don't know how to praise your Lord. God will give you groanings in the spirit. And literally in the Greek it says, God will take hold together with you against. God will take hold together with you. You know what he does? As you pray in the Holy Ghost about things you don't know, God says, okay, I got this now. Because you gave me permission, I'm going to take hold of this together with you against. Then I'm going to turn it and work together for good. He said, if you don't pray, I, if you don't get involved, I can't take hold of it. <laughs> 
So literally, it starts with your prayer. I'm here to tell you, everything starts with a prayer. I remember when my family, it was, it was amazing. I was the first one saved. I got radically saved. Come on. How many radically saved people? You know what I'm saying? Not just fire insurance, fire. I mean, I, I've always been on fire one way or the other. I was. I, I mean, literally, I was on fire with hell. And I'm, next moment, I was on fire with heaven. I've never been in between. I don't understand lukewarm. Never played it. Lukewarm's good for nothing but spit. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah, yeah. To quote Jesus. Yeah. Come on. He wants you hot, he wants you cold, reach the lost, they make disciples, they in between, don't waste your time with them. Wait until they're willing to grow up. That's the way I look at it. But the bottom line is that when I got saved, the first thing that God put on my heart was Acts 16 31. Both you and your household shall be saved. And my number one decision was I was going to make sure none of my family would go to hell. I was going to stay in God's face. I was going to remind him of his promises. Come on. I was going to make it hard for them to perish. I was the first one saved in my family. But my family, you understand something about it? Every family is either matriarchal or patriarchal. How do you know every family has one person that's the king? You get that one person saved, most of the family comes in. It's just the way it is. In my family, it was my dad. My dad was one of the leading attorneys in America. We called him a professional sewer. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a genius. He went to he went to Columbia. He went to he went to Princeton undergraduate. Went to Columbia. Had a doctorate of law as I think he was 18 or 19 when he got his doctorate. Brilliant man. Known for his intellectual capacity. So is my son. Does skip generations. <laughs> I played a little bit of baseball. But that's not. Oh, that. But you know, I got the mind of Christ. I'm not complaining. <laughs> but when I got saved, I began to pray a lot, you know, and and you know, for a couple of years it didn't look like anything was changing. Don't quit. Don't quit. And then one day my dad called me up and, he, and I could tell something was wrong. He said, son, take a deep breath. And my mom had committed suicide. And for the first time in my dad's life, he couldn't write a check and make the pain go away. He couldn't go to a book and rationalize it. My dad was a rich man. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Because rich people don't see their needs sometimes. Come on. And it's hard for an intellectual to enter the kingdom because faith is of the heart, not of the head. But in this situation, my dad called me and he said, I don't know any preachers. Will you preach your mom's funeral? It's the first time I ever preached to adults with my mom's funeral service. I did some fellowship Christian athletes things before that with, with teenagers. My, and my dad got radically saved. Not just fire insurance. He got fired, man. But then he said, I want to go to church with you. And I didn't want him to go to church with me. <laughs> I kept thinking, when I, when I get him saved, how do I get him to a church that is sort of charismatic? Thumbs up. <laughs> Not a whole lot of emotion. Not a whole lot of gifts of the Spirit. I want him to go to a professional church where Dr. So-and-so was the pastor. <laughs> I want him to go to a church with a parking lot full of Mercedes and, and Cadillacs. Unfortunately, I was going to an inner city church. We didn't have a parking lot. We had a policeman for the three cars that were there. So they'd still be there afterwards. We had a guard dog that lived in the church. Because many times when you were preaching, they kept the money in the office and there was a chimney there. So they put the guard dog in the office. Right when you preach, a lot of times you'd hear this dog barking, which meant a thief had been cornered. Oh. So you actually had to stop preaching to rescue the thief. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. So my, my, my dad said, I, I want to go to church with you after he got saved. 
So I prayed all night. How many of you have ever prayed this way? Lord, my dad's coming to church tomorrow. You haven't been moving the gifts of spirit. Don't start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, you know our pastor, you know, I, I wanted to go to church with Dr. So-and-so was the pastor. Our pastor couldn't spell doctor. <laughs> he was from Italy. We had two services, one Italian, one English. They both sounded alike. <laughs> so I said, Lord, you know our pastor's not very bright, but let him wax eloquent. I know he doesn't know what eloquent is. <laughs> We'll let him wax it anyway. <laughs> and I said, Lord, you know about Sister Chicken Walk? <laughs> Every time the Holy Ghost hits that woman, she's everywhere. <laughs> I said, Lord, there's a 24-hour virus going around. <laughs> Don't kill her, but keep her away. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> well, if you ask Anthony according to this will, he hears you. So he didn't hear a word I prayed for. <laughs> so on the way to church, how many of you understand? You know, we were, uh, we were leaving early because most people are territorial. <laughs> Have you ever noticed most people... It's always sit in the same seat. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have this theory that people rub their scent into their seat. They mark it. Because I've watched people, and it's, it's amazing when someone sits in your seat, I've watched people actually bend down and sniff, like, come on, dude! <laughs> So Sister Chicken Walk always sat in the middle. So I wanted to get there early so we could sit in the front. On the way to church, my dad says, is this going to be a wild church like a Southern Baptist? <laughs> I said, I hope so. <laughs> Everything's going well until the service starts. <laughs> Sister Chicken Walk's late that day. Because she's doing stretching exercises for the news <laughs> And when she comes in, we're, we're sitting, we're sitting in front of her. And she comes in late. And she, her seat's open. She doesn't even stop or even sniff. She comes to the front row where my dad and I are, and she gives me a hug as though I care. And she said, I feel led to sit with you today. I want to hit her with some red. So all during the service. My dad's on one side, I'm in the middle, sister chicken walks on the other, and I, I have my thumbs up pretending I'm worshiping. But I'm really saying, make her stop. And every time I pray that, she has these moves. And she's shaking everywhere, and my dad's just staring at her. <laughs> And then that morning, everyone had a tongue. Everyone had a interpretation. Everyone had a prophecy, some real, some false. But everyone had a... God wasn't speaking until my dad showed up. And then three big ushers jumped on a little lady, cast the devil out of her. We never had deliverance until my dad got it. I thought it couldn't get any worse, and the pastor got up to preach. By that time, I stopped praying. I just crossed my fingers behind my back. I said, eloquent, eloquent. He, the pastor said, you'll never forget my message. I never have. He said, today, church, I want to talk about being hairs of God. I want to put signs in silent age, but no, we are hairs of God. We are joint hairs. He talked about living as clean hairs, washing in the water of God's word. I was waiting for the split ends. I'm staring at my dad. He's not moving. I'm thinking, he's the president of the Bar Association. He's professor emeritus at Columbia, Columbia Law School. 
He's recognized as one of the top legal minds in the world. And he's listening to the hairs of God. <laughs> and I knew that I, I knew that the sermon was almost over because the pastor began to cry. In that particular denomination, you can't preach unless you cry. It's in the handbook. <laughs> I believe it's why the women don't wear makeup. <laughs> Go on now. Don't ask me about makeup, I'll tell you the truth. That one lady said, what do you think about makeup? I looked there and said, buy something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> they started crying. I knew the service was almost over. He said, Church, this is serious. Sometimes a hair backslides. <laughs> Are you one of God's missing hairs? <laughs> He's got God going bald. <laughs> so we're we, 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 we driving home. We're driving home and and my dad's not saying a word. And I'm not saying a word, which is a miracle. And he looks over at me finally. He said, that was different. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, a hair is a guy. He said, that's great. He's laughing. He said, what's he preaching on Wednesday night? I said, are you going? to I would miss this man. <laughs> I mean, before, by the end of the month, he's on the organ. His sister chicken walks walk. <laughs> statements. He said, when you, this is what God spoke to me. He said, when you're ashamed of your church, you're ashamed of your God. Uh, that's right. When it's good enough, if it's good enough for you, why don't you think it's good enough for them? That's right. And then the Holy Spirit said this. He said, you're not ashamed of the Father, you're not ashamed of the Son. But when someone you cared about was coming, you asked me not to express myself. He said, son, if you ever do that again, I'll never express myself <laughs> in your presence again. So I don't care how offend everyone else. I won't offend the Holy Ghost. If I think it's the Holy Ghost, we're doing it. Yeah. If it might be the Holy Ghost, we're doing it. Yeah. Come on now. Amen. I will not offend the Holy Spirit. Are you not? Come on. You know? But everything started with prayer. You start thinking about the early church when they were not being politically correct and they got threatened. You know, it bothers me that, you know, you say what's right now and people get so intimidated. I mean, they, people get intimidated over what bathroom to use. Mm -hmm. It used to be that hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Dumb and dumber. <laughs> okay, move around. <laughs> you see in Acts chapter 4. The early church was threatened, told not to, to preach that name anymore. You know, just like there is a lot of threatening on don't go there. Well, if you tell me not to go there, I'm, I'm going there. I am going there. Come on now. If it's in the Word, I'm going there. Come on. Hey. May make someone feel uncomfortable. Oh, oh. God forbid if someone gets a conviction gets saved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say I'm okay, you're okay. That's right. Yeah, man. I'm yes. not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But when they, when they were threatened, they said, well, you don't, you don't preach anymore. They went back to their company. That's why you have to get you have to have faith-filled people. Yes. You go back to your faith-filled people, and they didn't pray for protection. They prayed for boldness. Yes. They said they think we're vile. They think we're politically incorrect. We're going to pray we'll be more vile, more politically incorrect. Come on. Then we might speak your word with great boldness. Amen. Stretch forth your hands yes. in the mighty name of your servant Jesus. Do mm -hmm. signs, wonders, and miracles. And said after they prayed, mm -hmm. the place was shaken. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is what God showed me. He said there are things that need to be shaken, but we, it's only after we pray. Mm 
This nation needs a God shaking. Yes. After you pray, the nation can be shaken. After you pray, there's things out of order in your house that can be shaken. Yes. After you pray, the place is shaken. Yes. Come on now. Yes. You see, you know, I believe God that God wants that that to do that with you. How many of you, you know, you want to see the move of God? Yes. How many of you want to see things change? Yes. Yes. You know, I'll be honest with you. If you don't pray, everything stays the same. And I don't want the church to stay the same. My life radically changed when I came to another level of prayer. It's amazing. Doesn't mean we don't have attacks. It doesn't mean nothing slows us down. Come on. Let me show you something, and then we'll end it here. Because, uh, you know, how many of you understand that, that you catch the anointing? I believe to, today God wants to put a fresh man on prayer on you. Yes. There's something that's going to happen supernaturally. That is honestly not, it's not just going to be a discipline, it's going to be the life of God working in you. Something happened several years ago. I remember I was preaching in Missouri. It's a remote area, kind of like driving up to here a lot of times, Wisconsin. Very remote. I grew up in New York City. Everything's remote. <laughs> All on that. But, uh, you know, when I talked to the pastor, and I, you know, that was about 30 years ago, he said, we don't have a hotel within 30, 40 miles of this place. <laughs> He said, you mind staying at this lady's home? I said, I don't stay at ladies' homes. There's a reason yes. I've been married as long as I've been married. Yes. Come on now. Yes. I said, I don't stay. They said, well, she's 85. <laughs> and I was like 38 at the time. Yeah, I'm 39 now, at least by the <laughs> Yeah, you know. It's funny, I've been married 38 years, but I'm 39. Yeah. Yeah. I've been married 38 years, and my wife is 29. Yeah. It's a miracle! <laughs> but she, you know, he said, you know, do you mind staying there? I said, fax me a picture. I'll run it by my wife. If she said that looks good, I'll stay there. It's wisdom. And sure enough, she looked like an Amish cookbook. You know what I'm saying? A little grandma. <laughs> <laughs> she five foot by five foot with a bun. <laughs> and my wife looked and said, if she looks like that, you can stay there. And the pastor warned me. He said, she's a, she's a major intercessor. I said, well, my wife is, so that's no problem. So I got, I never forget going to that house and she 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 cooked like an Amish grandma, thank God. <laughs> and I, I mean it was so good. I mean I remember eating at seven and what a, what a great meal. And as soon as the meal was over, she looked at me, she said, Aren't you going to bed yet? It was 7.30 at night. <laughs> you understand, my early morning prayers usually before I go to sleep at night, uh, two or three in the morning. <laughs> I'm a night out. But he, she said, aren't you going to bed yet? I, I, I looked at her. I said, it's kind of early. She said, she said no, nah, nah, it's late. So I went up to the prophet's chambers. And I, I read until about 2 in the morning. At 4.30 in the morning, I hear this sound. Reporting for duty, sir. Devil, I'm your worst nightmare. And she began to rip in tongues. Literally shaking the house. She's 85 years old. I'm holding on to the bed, going back and forth. I, I haven't had my coffee yet. Come on. I said, you're not right. <laughs> so about, you know, four hours later, I go down the stairways, and she looks at me. She said, Brother Woody, did you sleep okay? I said, they're not a demon within miles of this place. Every morning, 4.30. Reporting for duty, sir. I mean, I was there a week. It changed my life because as soon as I got home from preaching at night, I went right up in bed because I knew at 4.30 in the morning, we were reporting for duty, sir, whether I want to or not. 
<laughs> yeah. And I, she, I asked her how long she'd been doing this, and she said, "My my husband died when I was in my early thirties. So I've been doing it ever since." And she'd go to church with her little tiny purse, and she'd walk, kind of shuffle along. <laughs> All the demons are going. Ah, ah, ah. I called. I nicknamed her Grandma Rambo. <laughs> She was a Holy Ghost terrorist. <laughs> Come on. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm saying, whoa. And when I left that place, good, I ended up going back for 10 years. She had died at age 95. It's only, probably the only time in Scripture where both heaven and hell were in agreement. They both rejoiced. <laughs> <laughs> And I was going to do my little prayer like Shangri-La things. Praying in the spirit, so I'm done the body on all sides. Reporting for duty, it came out of my spirit. <laughs> Devil, I'm your worst nightmare. And I began praying in tongues and a level. I thought, whoa, I caught something. I caught something. I caught something. And every year I'd go back and get recharged, 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 recharged. So I believe you can catch something. Come yes, on now. Yes. See, I, I can teach what I know, but I can reproduce who I am. I am a man of prayer. So I literally can reproduce vision, and I can reproduce, come on, yes. prayer. Because that's who I am. It's a part of who I am. I can teach other stuff, but I can reproduce, and I'm here to impart something. Hallelujah. You teach at a distance, you're a part of place. Mm -hmm. You teach other people's kids, you train your own. Mm -hmm. How do you know if they're your kids? You can't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> and you try, you try, you try everything. If they don't leave, they're yours. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> But many of you today, God wants to take your prayer life to a whole different level. Yes. He wants all of a sudden, He wants to work in you, come on now, and work through you. You know, God told me, He said, He said, I got so much more, but my people don't want the more. If they want, if they'd ask more, I can give them more. And usually you have as much God as you really want. He's not withholding. <coughs> Come on. He wants to pour it all out. It's all yours. They said, if you don't want it, he said, I can't get it to you. So whatever you desire when you pray. Mm -hmm. Whatever you desire, God works on your desires. How many of you today you just said, God, I want my prayer life in a different level? Yes. I want my prayer life on there. Wherever you're stuck, it's, you need to ask God to get unstuck. Yeah, you, you have to ask God to open your eyes because wherever you're stuck, you're not seeing what you need to see to get unstuck. And you need to ask God, God, show me. Show me. Show me the next move. Show me the next step. Show me. Don't accept being stuck as a way. And I guess, you know, if God wanted me to have No, he gave it to you. You can live off your earnings, you always live poor. You can live off your inheritance, you always live rich. You live off your earnings, it's based on what you can do. You live off your inheritance, it's based on what he has done. Yes, that's good. Hallelujah. Very good. Grace is God out, out, hands outstretching you with everything you need for life and godliness. Faith is the proper response to grace. It's a God I receive. Thank you. I receive, I receive, I receive. Thank you. See, that's why the just shall live by faith. Why? Because it begins with grace. God shows you grace and said, do you believe it? God shows you grace. Do you believe it? Will you receive it? And it takes the hum humble to receive grace because the proud want to do it on their own. When they feel clean enough, they'll receive. Terrible way to live. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, the best way to live is to realizing it's all yours and that God's, and, and you're just responding to the grace of God. The grace will teach you to say no to sin. Till we, some of us, we want to fight sin apart from grace and we'll, never, and we'll give into it, and then we eventually end up in a false level of grace because we know we can't win on the thing. 
So we basically give in and then create a whole theology. With true grace, and the reason why people, there's a false grace and a true grace is that grace is the word. That's right. That's why. That's why. You understand that's why. And God gives grace to the humble. What do the humble people do? They come before God and say, God, I need. God, I know you've already provided, but Lord, I'm here to receive. I'm here to receive. I'm here to receive. I, I have to realize, God, I need you. I, God, I, apart from you, I can do nothing. But I'm not apart from you, but I'm going to connect. God, I know healings are already mine, but I want to receive my healing. I'm not trying to get you to heal me. You did that 2,000 years ago. I'm positioning myself to receive it. Yes, that's good. I'm not trying to get you to bless me. You already blessed me. Whatever spiritual blessing, heavenly places, I'm just positioning myself to receive it. God, I'm just coming before you. That's the right position. That's what righteousness is. The ability to stand in God's presence without the sense of guilt, fear, and inferiority. And honestly, it's because of the gift of righteousness and, and the grace of God we reign in life. And you come and get, receive more grace. More grace. God said, hey, hey, I got more. I got more. How many of you want the more? Yes. Yes. He said, if you want the more, you'll pray. If you want the more, you'll pray. If you want the more, you'll pray. You'll ask. Come on now. Ask for more, God said. Ask for more. And he said, well, I, I don't need it. Well, someone else does. Ask for more. Amen. Come on now. Yeah. Sometimes I need it so someone else can get it. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's not for me. That's your honesty. The truth is love is once you realize all your needs are met. <clears throat> so now you're always accessing things for other people. God, their faith is not there yet, but mine is. So I'm going to access it. Get it over to them and then build their faith so they can access the yes. Yes. Oh, if, if you want that mail of prayer, just stand where you are. Stand where you are. Something's going to fall in this place. Some of you, and, and, and if you, if some of you would pray like me, when I prayed years ago, God help me to become a man and woman of prayer. Just begin to talk to him that way. God, I'm, Maybe when your prayer life's not where it needs to be, and, and, and it's not you, your self-effort, it's God. It's God working in you. Come on. Yes. And Father, right now we're releasing a fresh mantle of prayer in this place, God. God, the prayers, the right, the prayer, prayer of righteous men avail much. Yes. Thank you, Lord. I'm asking for a fresh mantle, yes. a fresh anointing, God. That God, that things are going to change like never before, from Amen. faith to faith, from glory to glory. Yes. That things that have been reserved for us will get to us because we're praying. That things with that our voice will activate our blessing. Yes, thank you. That our prayers will hold back judgment. Yes. That because we pray, people will get saved. Blinders will be removed. Yes. I'm asking God, show us the importance of standing in the gap. Yes. Spirit-led prayer, God. Spirit-led, not, not just praying generals, but show us specifics and specific people, God. Targets, God. Father, we thank you right now, the heathen, our inheritance. Give us our heathen. Something's about ready to break in here. If you need a healing, just receive. I mean, guess what? You know, it's, we're not trying to get God to heal. It. We're just trying to receive what's already ours. Yes. So, Father, I release that healing virtue right now, Father. I thank you from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. God, you are working. Healing and health in our bodies. Blood pressures are being regulated. Blood sugar is being regulated. Backs. In knees, in joints, there's fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil. Things are being loosed right now. Holy Ghost giftings being loosed right now. Oh, the ability to make wealth being accessed right now. God, and we know whoever controls the ideas control the wealth. So we thank you, God, you're dropping ideas. 
Something's beginning to break in the realm of the spirit. Fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil. God, God, oh, help us to enjoy you. <laughs> help us, oh God, to laugh. Come on. Help us, God. Fill us. Fill our mouth with joy. With joyful shouting. Thank you. Open our eyes so we can live the dream. Help. I thought we release dreams and visions. I'm asking you, God, to revisit visions, past visions that are now, are now at the time of its fulfillment. Bring it back to the forefront, God. Restore youth, God. Something's breaking in this place right now. Oh, some of you, you just, you just know, you just know, you just know. You, you, some of you are so sensitized to the Holy Ghost. Watch out, watch out. Oh. Some of you guys say, I'm going to lay someone on your heart because I'm about ready to do something supernatural and I'm going to use your prayer. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Oh. God's going to make a way where there is no way. <laughs> Whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loose. You're, you're going to open up the gates so the king of glory can come in. You're going to use your authority Hallelujah. to open up a realm so heaven can invade earth. Come on now. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Right here, right now. In this place as it is in heaven. Something's beginning to break. God said, I'm about, I'm about, I'm about ready to, 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 to manifest on the outside when I've already begun to work on the inside. Visions that you've had for years are beginning to get stirred again. We're pregnant, but we're about ready to birth. Get ready, get ready, get ready for this area. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on. Just get, get, just get ready. Begin to call it, call it, call it, call it. Call it. It's on its way. Call it. Hallelujah. And call unto me, and I'll show you what else to call. God's about ready to give new strategies, new weapons. Something's breaking in the realm of spirit. Oh, the glory of God's about ready to blow through this place. <laughs> oh, he has made you glad. He has made you glad. Come on, we rejoice because he... Ah, ha, ha, ha. He said, open that wide your mouth. I'll feel it. Oh, ah. <laughs> 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 open it wide. I'll feel it. <laughs> so you, you have your mouth wide open, but in the wrong direction. Now get open it wide now, and God will feel it. <laughs> Some of you have a vision of Eden, so I'm going to release you in a second. So you're going to be really, really happy. Yeah? Thank you, Father. Oh, come on, come on. Some of you will walk out and say, man, wow. I got it all. I got it all. Now I'm going to access it all. That's what prayer does. Prayer accesses yes. what's already yours. Hallelujah. As I gave it all, access it. Don't ask small when I blessed you big. Some of you, honestly, you sense God. God's going to renew your youth. Hallelujah. I want to satisfy your life with good things so your youth is renewed like the eagles. How many of you got something this morning? It's going to go a little different in a way tonight, but it's going to be the same time. We're, it, church is training and reigning. Yes. That's what it is. In a marriage supper, the lamb is not, it's not after we get beat up. That's right. No, it's not a cons consolation dinner. It's a, victory. <laughs> <laughs> it's a victory, man. Come on. Not too many people preach like it's the consolation dinner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got whooped. 
No, 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 no. Yeah, we don't leave until we win. That's right. Well, Pastor, I'm going to let you have it because 